Actually, I was uh, raised in Madison County. I was raised out at Newmarket and uh, went to school out there. Uh, went to uh, I went to Auburn. Uh, got interested in a lady, and uh, she was an underclassman. So I ended up uh, staying at Auburn and getting a master's degree. Uh, and and we eventually got married. So you know things all things worked out pretty good. Um, I graduated from high school here in 1953. So prior to that, we moved uh, uh, to Huntsville when I was. Uh, six years old. My mom and dad were down in uh, Conecuh County, and so they moved up here. Dad had a job with the state, and uh, uh, it was during the war, and so we knew things that was going on. Daddy then took us out to uh, Newmarket uh, to keep me and my brothers and sisters off the streets of Funsfield. And uh, it was an old, grown-over place, and so they ended up putting us to work, and that's the way we stayed out of trouble. Mother always had something for us to do. Well, uh, I got a BS degree in '57. Uh, there wasn't a really a lot of people around knocking on my door trying to recruit me. I'd found this girl down there that I was dating, and uh, turned out I was started dating her, and I was a senior, and she's a freshman. And so I uh, had a friend of mine uh, there, my roommate, he said, well, why don't we just go to graduate school? And uh, so uh, we went over and checked, and it turned out that at that point in time, Auburn was just starting a master's program in mechanical engineering. And we just graduated with BS in mechanical. And they took a couple of us uh, from Auburn and let us go into that graduating class. Uh, and then I took a job down in um, Pensacola, working for, at that time, Kim Strand. Montesano later bought them out. Uh, I came back up to Huntsville on, uh, on vacation from uh, down there, running to a guy that I knew down at Auburn. And he was uh, asking me what I was doing. I told him, asked him what he's doing. He told me, he said, you know, said we're, we're going, uh, and I have a space program. I said, you need to come up here and get involved in that. And I said, I don't even know anybody there or anything about that. Or, he said, well, hey, I'll give you an application. And I said, you fill it out, and I'll take it in and put it in the right place, and uh, we'll see here where it goes. Turned out he was actually working for Chrysler at the time. So I just made the application, sent it in, uh, they called me for an interview, and I came, uh, came up and interviewed and went to work for Chrysler in uh, December 1961. Well, when I was at Auburn, I took all of my electives in uh, structures, uh, materials, and concrete, and the idea that I'm going to be a stress guy, you know, when I take a job. Well, when I come to Chrysler, and told Chrysler I wanted a stress job. They said, well, we don't have any vacancies in that. But uh, we see that you've got a good background and, and heat transfer and that type of thing here. So we have some work and uh, requirements in there. And uh, if we have an opening in the stress group and you're not happy in this uh, uh, fluid and thermal group, well, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll let you change, you know. And so I started to work, and, they, and the first job I had was designing a calorimeter that, uh, where you could determine what the heat flux was. And so I was out trying to design uh, uh, and have built a prototype for a, a calorimeter. And I don't think, I, I know I had it designed, but uh, the guy come in to me, and boss come in to me and one day and said, uh, said, hey, said, uh, we've got a request from uh, the government to send us some more people out on, out on the arsenal. And said, you'd be out there working with uh, NASA and you'd be on the arsenal. And said, we've already shown them your resume and uh, they think you'd fit the bill. Are you willing to go out and interview? Well, I said, yeah. Uh, I wasn't, I was just getting started with them. I didn't know anybody uh, particular or anything. And so 
I went out there and they let me interview with a couple of guys. One of them was a external heat transfer. We're doing base heating and that type of thing here, which I knew nothing about. And uh, the other one was doing internal flow and heat transfer, you know, inside the uh, mold out of the vehicle. And uh, so they both said I, they were, I was acceptable. They were both looking for people. So I took the one with the internal uh, flow in the, in the vehicle, in the, in the tanks. Uh, I started to, to work in there, and uh, absolutely, the first day I think I went in onto the job, and it may not have been absolutely the first day, but I walked into the uh, office, and uh, the guy told me, my supervisor told me, said, well, they ran a static test last night on SAT 11, and said they laid in the burn said they lost tank pressure up to 11 PSI a second and said they aborted the test. He said, go figure out what went wrong. And I didn't know from nothing, you know. So, uh, but uh, he said, you know, he said, go to, down and talk to uh, Burglar. And Burglar had a, a experimental shop uh, there in what's uh, 4610 or 4612 now maybe. And uh, so I went down there and looking for some way I could make a, a model that we could t test the flow in it or something and uh, walked in and the first guy I saw was a guy that I'd been in school with down in Auburn, a guy named Hugh Campbell. And he'd been up here a couple of three years and he took me in and says, let's go see what we can find. So we went out through the boneyard and you know, he and I, we picked up stuff made a, uh, a flow test rig. So we started running the test, and the way the uh, flow was set up was running the test on the on Saturn 1. And so it has the center locks tank, and around the outside it's got full fuel and four oxidizer. And from the outboard oxidizer tanks, they fed the in, inboard tank, fed the outboard tank. Well, they were worried about getting flow when it comes from the inboard tank into the outboard tank. They were worried about it uh, having some two-phase flow in it and train vapor. So to keep that from happening, they went in and ran the, uh, the pipe up in the, in the outboard tank. Well, you don't have to be a genius to figure it out is that if you take a hose and stick it in the tub of water and point it up when you drop the level, after a while, that thing becomes a fountain. And, and we were using hot uh, uh, oxygen to pressurize the uh, uh, liquid oxygen. And when you sprayed that liquid oxygen into the uh, ullage area, it just took all the heat out of the gas and the gas pressure just went like it fell off a cliff. And so, you know, bingo, within a week, you know, we had the explanation and uh, knew what we was doing went out and looked at the literature and figure out what you do. And so we went in and then, and the solution to that was go in and we made a, a little coolie head. You might have seen them as a little uh, diffuser type thing upside down. And so as soon as the flow would come across and up, it'd be deflected back down uh, into the liquid again and wouldn't spray up into the ullage area. And so that became the, uh, the solution that they flew for the uh, first, uh, the Saturn I flight. The Saturn I-Bs, when they came along different, they changed the manifold in the bottom and, uh, and put a sump on the bottom of the outboard tanks where they could bring it into the sumps and didn't have to bring it in into the tank uh, uh, itself. So, uh, but, but, you know, but we fixed it in a, or found out what it needed to be fixed, you know, within a period of, I don't know, a week or so, you know. Man, we we were hustling and uh, got, I felt like we just lucky, you know. <laughs> the only uh, thing that we had to do analysis with was a slide rule and a Marshawn or Frieden calculators. There wasn't anything else, you know. Yeah. We went through uh, college, uh, and learned how to use slide rules and uh, the best thing about the slide rule in that process 
is you have to estimate the answer. And so when you run it out, you're going to just get, you can read three digits, maybe four digits if you're really good, you know. And so uh, what we really did then is you got to know where to put the decimal place. So you got to go in and estimate the answer and have an idea of what that answer is in order to put the decimal place. And so uh, that gives us a feel for the numbers. And the one thing that I've learned, and it's been a great help over the years, is I still have a feel for numbers. You know, you go in and you stick something in a computer and you get something out of the computer, you don't necessarily know where it's right or not. Maybe you made a mistake in the, in the program, you know. But well, the, uh, the big issue for the thing here, when uh, we were working uh, and the German team was here, but they weren't going, they weren't going to the moon. They, they wanted to, and they thought they might be, but hey, they wanted the military dictated that they could only work on things with a certain range and, and this type of thing here. And when, uh, I guess, Kennedy got involved with the uh, things in, uh, in Cuba, and then he had the uh, Soviets pressing him, uh, and that type of thing here, they thought he was a young kid and he, you know, they could take advantage of it. He had to do something to keep the uh, uh, Europeans aligned with us rather than have them go all lined up with the Russians. So his idea and his advisor's ideas was they go to the moon. Now, when that did, that really turned the Germans loose. But from our perspective, uh, it turned out that we started designing uh, was part of the design effort to design uh, the Saturn V. The Saturn 1B, 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 1B be big enough to go to the moon. And so they started out and they had the F1 engine uh, that was in test. And so we started designing, they baseline that engine and we started designing it. Uh, it was our job to design the uh, feed systems, the pressurization systems, uh, the things that, uh, how you get propellants on the uh, vehicle and from the ground and how you get them and uh, satisfy the engine requirements, uh, what, what sort of pressures you design and provide so that you can maintain structural integrity uh, from both collapse and uh, overpressure. So those were all issues that uh, we were designing. Uh, I personally was designing primarily the fuel system of uh, the uh, S1C, and they say there's a C1, one F1, and then that wasn't enough, had to make two. So now we had a C2, it's two F1s, you know. And then eventually they, every time, you know, we kept the same type designs, but now we multiply, uh, okay, you know, this engine and feed system's here, but now we've got another one right beside it, and then we've got another one over here, and then we got another one over here, and soon we had four, and we were designing it uh, uh, all they were individually uh, designed, but then you had to put them collectively and, and, and integrate them. And how do you control uh, all the uh, flows and pressures and uh, and that type of thing? Yeah. So what that we were working uh, that, and then the great thing that uh, they really did is they decided to go and fill that uh, middle spot with a fifth engine. And now we had all sorts of margins from a payload standpoint, and we were rolling. You got the basic theories. You got heat transfer, uh, and, and uh, you got uh, uh, fluid flow conditions. You can calculate flow. It doesn't make any difference where what size the pipe is. It's just the numbers change. But the process is the same. And it's kind of the same way with the heat transfer. You got uh, the heat transfer, You if you go through uh, natural convection, you got force convection. You just figure out uh, if you want to know how much heat you're going to transfer on the sidewall of the tank, you go in and look for data in the literature for vertical surfaces. And, uh, and so there's lots of data out there. The, the, the trick is 
and and the data has got plus or minus 20 percent on it generally because that's the way you take data and the way that we data in the literature and so we go out and we guess the answer it's about we assume it's about like this and we're running numbers on it and then we go out and try to configure a test someplace that see if we can get a a better number and see if we can squeeze down the variation is not plus or minus 20 it's plus or minus another smaller number but you you just keep reassuring yourself as you go along that uh, the assumptions that you're making is good assumptions and after a while you got the data that uh, says instead of you know we wandered around a little bit now but this is a real point The Pogo problem was unforeseen. We designed the uh, uh, feed systems and uh, connected them to the engines and connected them to the structure and, uh, and all, and uh, we ground, test fired them. But we didn't have any idea that there could be a coupling and an instability between the propulsion system and the structure. In fact, Ben, it's the first thing that really come to our realization when uh, the guy I was telling you about, Gordon Platt, he read Aviation Week, and he saw the N11 failure on the Titan II. And it, uh, it had a long feed line on it, and he came in one morning, and we started talking about maybe that long feed line has something to do with this uh, instability. Now, we don't calculate the feed line frequencies, or it wasn't at that time, uh, but the structures guys knew what their frequencies was. And so uh, Gordon says, get on the plane, find some guys at Denver, go out and talk to those guys, and let, us, let them see if that is likely to have, be a problem that we had. I get on the plane, we go to Denver, nicest guys you ever want to meet, uh, they take me in, they, they uh, are familiar with uh, our configuration some. I showed them sketches for the rest of it. They carried me out. They walked me through their, uh, how they did an analysis. They walked me through how they did their test program, carried me up to the test stands on the, on the hill, uh, took me in and showed me the uh, accumulators that they were building and the standpipes that they were building to solve the, uh, their problem and uh, where they changed the designs of the feed line and all and uh, <clears throat> and so they give us a running start but this was probably 1964 uh, we're always cutting hardware components are out on the uh, design uh, you can't analyze stability uh, you can analyze it, but you can't find out stability as long as it's on the ground because the uh, uh, hold-down clamps are all this keeps the company or occur. You're only going to see it in flight. So uh, I uh, and uh, Marshall ha hired the Martin guys, and uh, they hired some, uh, put together a POGO team to go off and work it. Uh, we got out on the lab out here and... Uh, we figured out uh, what the feed line frequency is. We found the feed line frequency out by taking an oscillogram and rolling it down in the hall out there in the test area and then expanding it greatly and then going through and reading the, the times, the, what the frequency was, and as the frequency changed, uh, we went and looked and see what was happening on pump inlet condition, and we had a plot of frequency versus pump inlet. The only problems we wasn't we wasn't sure it was right, but it was the only data that we had, and it came off a real system. So we began to use it and did the do the analysis, and it turns out that uh, we had a uh, an analysis that they want you to have like 6 dBs of stability. That's a factor of two. Well, our analysis was showing about one dB of uh, stability. Now it turns out that, uh, you know, normally that wouldn't be very much. We didn't know how good our model was. We didn't know how good the uh, 
uh, propulsion data was. I knew where I got it from, and I, I was pretty confident in it. I just didn't know whether they're exactly right or not. And then the structures guys, they had pretty good data because they'd run the dynamic test vehicle and uh, had their structure design, and it normally couples with the first mode, so they, pretty, they knew what that, that was. So we had a pretty good analysis, except we didn't know where it was any good. Uh, we were on the plane going down to the Cape, to, for the L minus two day review. And Von Braun said, let me see your charts. And so we gave him the charts and he was flipping through the charts and this type of thing here. And when he came to that stability plot where that uh, came down showing and getting less and less stability and then finally going back and getting more stability again. And at a minimum instability out about 120, 125 seconds in that general time frame. I don't remember the exact number. But Von Braun said that won't never go. And uh, he said, uh, maybe we can take this area down here and we can cross hatch uh, the area and, and argue that uh, this is the range of the things here and the chart that's got the curve on it. That's just the worst case. And so uh, I had the job of going and replotting that chart and the uh, the guy that was making the presentation there, he was uh, made the presentation. I got the charts made and I slipped it into the stack of charts where it was supposed to come up at. And he was going on to his presentation until he come to that chart. And boy, it hit the fan. And it was uproar in the room. And they, everybody was trying to talk at once. And, you know, and so <clears throat> finally, uh, they, uh, they kind of agreed that uh, uh, that was that. It was that was the case. Uh, we didn't know how much margin it was. We hadn't seen it on the ground because you can't see it on the ground, and we hadn't had a flight yet. And the first flight was going to be unmanned, and so they decided we'll fly it, and we did. And it turns out that we got very little instability, but at the time we predicted minimum instability, we got a little bit of uh, vibration there. And it uh, showed up, and it uh, turns out that they had, from the Titan program, they had worked and said that for the crew to be safe, the uh, vibration needs to be less than uh, a quarter of a G. Now, we were below a quarter of a G. I don't remember the exact number, but we were less than a quarter of G. So it wasn't a, a big issue. And uh, so we ended up on the second flight. We basically went back and flew it again. Now, the structure changed a little bit on the second flight. The propulsion and the engines, they were different, but they were the same. And so it turns out that on the, on the second flight, which was also unmanned, uh, we had a, uh, a, a kind of a disaster on the whole thing. First stage had a pogo problem. Uh, the second stage had one engine go out, and when that one engine went out, the wires were crossed, and they, that pre-valve shut, and then the, when that one went out, it went out and shut the pre-valve, it already failed. And so we had two engines out, and uh, then when the uh, uh, S4B start, uh, uh, and it burned into on into orbit. So, uh, we, and I think we had a panel come off the slaw up way high, something like that. So, you know, every stage had something go wrong. And then they, either right before, right after that, they wanted to, uh, they announced that the first flight, next flight was going to be all up and manned. And so, you know, we got this problem now because on the second flight we showed a bigger uh, instability, and so now we had to had to fix it. And so it it was fortunate we had uh, had knew we might have a problem. We'd already been working on fixes, but nobody would let us implement it because they wasn't sure we had a real problem. But we'd been working on fences, uh, fixes of putting uh, a gas. Uh, in the line to change the feed line frequency. You can't change the structural frequency. It costs too much weight. 
you know. And so you got to change your propulsion frequency, and you really can't change the engine itself because it's designed and qualified. So you got to change something that's easy to change compared to the other two, and that's feed line. Turned out that we found a, uh, we knew that till we could put helium in, and we went so far as to know if we let that helium get out and got into the engine, it wouldn't cause any problems. So we knew that wasn't an issue. So we ended up on the uh, third flight putting some helium in, a, in the pre-valve. And the pre-valve is a visor valve, and it's got a cavity behind the flow liner. So uh, we could uh, put the uh, helium in there, and it worked like a charm. I mean, it was, and you know, it's one of those things you just got lucky on. But part of our luck was due to work because we'd been working and looking for a solution that didn't have us to, you know, didn't have to completely redesign the vehicle. Turned out we found one. I guess the uh, first flight had really given us a lot of confidence in our analysis. It had the, uh, had the frequency and had the minimum stability right where we predicted it would be at. So we had a good, good confidence in it. So we then had good confidence that, that if we change that frequency uh, on the feed system, it should decouple those systems. So we had, uh, had felt good about our fix, and we knew that it had worked on the Gemini or similar things had worked on the Gemini. So we had that uh, confidence going for it. We had the uh, Martin company and the uh, other companies come in and they knew what we were doing and uh, they looked at it and they agreed that uh, that's a good solution. So when we got ready to, uh, to fly that uh, first man flight, we had confidence in that S1C stage Pogo not being a problem. I'm, I'm pretty even keel. Uh, I have a, a, a bit of a personal philosophy. Uh, if you have an issue, you work the issue before the flight. And if you now don't have your issue solved before the flight, you know, you can't fly. And, and if you agree to fly, then uh, the issue is under control. As far as I can do, I've done all I can do. I can't do any more. I've, I've done this, now we've got to go fly it. And, and so I, I, didn't, I didn't really worry about, about flights. And I know a lot of people go in and wring their hands and, and all that, but I never was one of those guys. Uh, I'm going I'm to work hard, and I'm going to fix it, and when I say we're ready to go, I don't have any open issues, uh, I'm ready to go. Uh, the guy I went to work for after I came, when I first came in from uh, Chrysler, a guy named Charles Wood. Charles was a older guy than I was, uh, went to Auburn, uh, but uh, he went to, uh, worked up at Langley and worked up for the NACA and then came to Marshall uh, for the uh, uh, programs uh, here with the uh, uh, Saturn programs and this type of thing here. And Charlie was a, uh, boy, he was a stickler uh, for details. And he uh, would give you the job, he'd let you go off and work it. And when you come back, he'd scrub you with a wire brush. He'd ask every question that, that he could think of, and you had to, uh, he'd want to know where you get your data from, where'd you make your assumptions, how did you know that's a good assumption? He just looked at and picked at every detail of what he had. But when you satisfied him, you was ready to go because he was the harshest critic you had. He was also the guy that the first time I made a presentation uh, to uh, uh, a lab director here in town, I'd been through that type of thing here and he'd scrub me and that type of thing here. And when I got up there, the uh, uh, deputy lab director started in on my case. Every chart, he had a bunch of uh, questions to be asked. And about the third or fourth chart, Charlie stood up back in the back of the room and 
told him, says, I've reviewed his presentation. Says, I think it's in good shape. I think he's going to answer all your questions. But in case he doesn't, you will cover them at the end. And he pulled me off of me, uh, the question off me, and my, I have never I forgot it. You know, he was a guy that uh, if you could satisfy him, he'd stay with you. And, but, but you had to satisfy him because he was going to probe you and, and, and check you and uh, everything. So We were flying in the 60s. We were flying the uh, uh, Saturn Vs. We were going to the moon. And uh, this thing of operations being different from development, that's a shuttle program. That's, I was not. Uh, on a Saturn program issue. Apollo didn't do it that way. We followed that thing. Uh, we were uh, looking at uh, data on every flight, and we had the uh, uh, people in Hosk. We got the data immediately. We reviewed that data. Uh, being NASA people, we re reviewed the data with our contractors, and uh, any problems we fixed, uh, we found we fixed for the next flight. I thought a little bit about that, but I'm not a great philosopher. Uh, I, I consider myself an engineer. Uh, we're solving problems. And that uh, when uh, Apollo came along, it was a solution to a problem. And the, uh, the problem was that we had an edict from the president to put a man on the moon and bring him back safely in this decade. It, it turns out that uh, the world events, the uh, politics of the day uh, and all just came together and with the people, uh, the Germans were a big portion of that. Uh, they uh, picked up a lot of uh, uh, good talent, you know, and uh, education. It affected education. It affected uh, kids going to school. Uh, I think it, uh, it captured a lot of the uh, uh, people's interest. And it, uh, for that reason, uh, they were, it was able to be successful. Now, we did a lot of things that uh, uh, if we had a problem and we knew we needed to solve the problem, we might start two or three programs that could uh, potentially solve, resolve that issue. And it'd be signed to two or three different people. And whoever got theirs done first got to put theirs on the vehicle. That created a lot of competition, cost probably money because they had funded money, uh, multiple streams of things here. But schedule drove that. And uh, it, it's not, you don't want to get there someday, you want to get there this decade. And, and it, uh, I'm successful, I think, from the stack that uh, we had a, a Cold War that never turned to be hot. And that uh, we had competition uh, there as such that I think the uh, Europeans stay lined up with the U.S. and uh, doesn't align with the uh, uh, Soviets and this type of thing here. I think from that standpoint, uh, it was successful, but it was a moment in time. That moment passed uh, when we were successful on going to the moon in 69. About that same time, the uh, Vietnam War began to, to heat up and they needed more money for the uh, Vietnam War. Uh, Apollo going to the moon was kind of finished. It didn't need the money, so they tried to turn that down turn the money up, it's going to uh, Vietnam. So uh, those are just things that, and Vietnam catches the people's interest and, and that type of thing here. So you gotta have the commitment of the government, you gotta have the commitment of the interest of the people. As the movie Perfect Storm is it, probably that type of thing, you know. Uh, everything that's uh, necessary for that thing to happen at the same time.